Hello, my name is Nathan Rummel, and today in Modern Church History, we look at one of the heroes in Dutch Reformed history, and that is the Reverend Hendrik de Kock. Now, you might very well have never heard of this man. He was a very humble pastor in a little town of Ulrum in the Netherlands. And yet, in God's providence, this humble minister who was unknown to the world was used by God to start a very important reform movement. I think that today many ministers and church people need to listen to the courage and the faithfulness of Reverend Hendrik de Kock and also his elders and the leadership role that they played in reforming the church and also how ordinary saints in the Netherlands dared to stand up against the power of not only the state church but also the power of the king and the government. And so the story of Hendrik de Kock is a very inspiring story of a man who showed great courage and would not stop preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in the face of great, great persecution. And so today we look at Hendrik de Kock, someone who is not so well known in the world but is great in the kingdom of God. And the title of my talk is Hendrik de Kock and the Succession, or the Afskiding, that's the Dutch word, of 1834. So the story of a major reform movement in the Dutch Reformed State Church in the Netherlands in the 19th century, that is in the 1800s, in the sovereign province of God was led by a humble preacher in a little town. The Afskiding or the succession, as we say in English, of 1834. Now, 1834 is therefore a very important date in Reformed church history in the Netherlands. It was the first major reform movement in the Netherlands in modern church history. There would be a second one led by Abraham Kuyper called the Doliansi, or the grieved ones, aggrieved ones. But by the 1800s, the Dutch Reformed state church had become apostate. Well, the leading minister in this Reformation in the Dutch church was Pastor Hendrik de Kock. Ron Gleeson calls Hendrik de Kock a kind of Dutch Martin Luther, and that is exactly what he was. He was a man of the people, although he was well-educated, but he was a small-town pastor. Hendrik de Kock was born in 1801 and passed away at a rather young age in 1842. And in his time, he was one of the typical apostate Dutch reform ministers. He was the product of the rationalistic, really unbelieving university training that was being given to Dutch ministers in his day. The Enlightenment had had a big effect on the Dutch reformed, unfortunately. And so he had gone to study at the University of Groningen, which is in the northeast part of the Netherlands, and there he trained for the ministry. The Dutch approach was for men to go to the university in order to be prepared for the ministry. At age 28, de Kock became pastor of the Reformed Church in the small town of Orum. This village was in the northeast of the Netherlands in the province of Groningen. In Hendrik de Kock's day, the vast majority of the ministers were apostate, although among the saints in the pew, it could be a different story. There could be found many, many God-fearing saints who love the Reformed faith and love the doctrines of the Reformation. While their ministers were not even reading or even aware of the confessions of the Reformed churches, these ordinary saints read good books on theology and piety, but amazingly, as a new pastor, Hendrik de Kock, even though he was a Reformed minister in the Netherlands, was ignorant of the confessional teachings of his church. In fact, it blows the mind, but he had never even read the Canons of Dort, even though they were one of the confessions of the church. He had even signed a formula of subscription in which he agreed to promote the doctrines found in the Reformed confessions. But apparently, the seminary or university where he studied there, the professors never taught the confessional documents to their students. Apparently, they didn't want their students to bring the great doctrines of the scriptures into the pulpit. And so prior to Hendrik de Kock's conversion, which happened when he was a pastor, he had 
never even read John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, which was one of the most influential books of the Protestant Reformation and in the Reformed churches. That's how ignorant he was of his heritage. So he was a Protestant minister, a Reformed pastor, who was ignorant of the doctrines of the Protestant Reformation. Back in 1816, King William I of the Netherlands had put new ecclesiastical regulations into law. These regulations that governed the Dutch Reformed State Church were entitled General Regulations for the Administration of the Reformed Church. And if you would read through these things, it would sort of remind you of all the crazy ecclesiastical laws that had developed during the Middle Ages. These regulations in the Dutch Reformed Church were very detailed, filling several books. And instead of the Word of God guiding these regulations, they simply included many rules that the church bureaucracy wanted. You know, historically, the Reformed Church has understood that it was elders in the local congregation who should have the oversight over the congregation. And the Reformed Churches had protected the autonomy of the local congregation. But now that was a thing of the past. Things were run from the top down. One candidate for the ministry, in fact, was appalled when he read for the first time through these ecclesiastical regulations. He said, I looked into the great stock of regulations in my father's library, but to me those books had neither soul nor life. I did not live in that atmosphere. And that was, of course, a, a correct analysis of the legalistic and unbelieving nature of all these rules. The Dutch king even had a department of religion that oversaw the ecclesiastical regulations. Among other things, for example, the regulations required the singing of man-made hymns, in addition to the psalms. Later, Hendrik de Kock would get in trouble for only wanting to sing the psalms. Now, by this time, the Dutch Reformed Church had been in long decline. After the Synod of Dort in 1618 to 1619, the Dutch rulers who belonged to the House of Orange had not even allowed another national synod to meet for hundreds of years. Therefore, no national synod had been able to meet in order to take heretics to task or to work at reforming the church. So a high point in Dutch Reformed church history was the Synod of Dort, but after that, things fell into decline. And when a National Synod was finally called in 1816, it was under the thumb of King William I. And the church had declined so much by that time that the Synod made a decision that undermined what had been up to this time, at least officially, the binding character of the Reformed creeds. The Synod of Dort had approved a formula of subscription for ministers and office bearers in which the office bearer needed to sign the fact that he believed in the doctrines of the Reformed faith and would defend them. This is what they declared. I quote, Our subscription that we heartily believe and are persuaded that all the articles and points of doctrine contained in the Confession and Catechism of the Reformed Churches together with the explanation of some points of the aforesaid doctrine made by the National Synod of Dortrecht in 1618 to 1619, do fully agree with the word of God. End quote. Now notice how the office bearer expressed that the doctrines contained in the Reformed Confessions fully agreed with the sacred scriptures. Now, however, under King William I's influence, a new formula of subscription watered this down. Instead, the officers vowed this, and I quote, that we will earnestly promote in both doctrine and life the interests of Christianity in general, as well as the, as the Netherlands Reformed Church community in particular, that we accept in good faith and heartily believe the doctrine that is in agreement with God's word and which is contained in the adopted forms of unity of the Netherlands Reformed Church, close quote. So notice, because so many of the ministers didn't believe the doctrines of the scripture, now all the office bearers simply needed to say was that they agreed with the doctrines found in the Reformed Confessions insofar as each one of them thought that they were in agreement with God's word. So this allowed ministers or elders to pick and choose what doctrines they wanted to believe and could believe and then preach. 
They only needed to believe what they wanted to believe out of the scriptures or the Reformed confessions. And that reflected the apostasy of the time. And so this change just provided official approval for the preaching of heresy, which was already widespread. Now, Hendrik de Kock himself was born in, on April 12 of 1801. He was the second of four children bought, born to Charda de Kock and Yanta Koppen de Boer. The future reformer's father, Charda, was first a sheriff and then a mayor in his town. So he was a rather influential man. The future reformer's mother, Yanta, was the daughter of a rich farmer. Therefore, the de Kock family did not grow up as peasants or as farmers from really the lower classes like many of my ancestors probably were, but the de Kock family were part of the middle class in Dutch society. And like English society at that time, Dutch society was very, very class, class conscious. Hendrik's grandfather on Tjarda's side of the family was a liberal preacher in the Reformed Church. The de Kock family held to a very rationalistic, moralistic, broad-minded form of liberal Christianity. Now, as a boy, Hendrik, given his status as a middle-class person, received a good education in the local public school. Tiarda, his dad, hoped that his son would pursue the ministry, not because he wanted his son to be an orthodox or biblical or confessional reformed pastor, but it was probably something that had to do with status. In order to prepare for university, Hendrik then attended Latin school so that he could gain acceptance to a university. So he received a good classical education and would learn how to write in Latin well. His university studies then occurred at Groningen. And that's also, of course, where his seminary studies occurred as well. There he studied under liberal professors who tried to use the language of Reformed theology while actively undermining Reformed theology. That's something liberals do. One liberal professor, for example, argued that the real reformer in the Reformation era was Erasmus and not Calvin or Luther. And as a result, that prof taught Erasmus's semi-Pelagian view of salvation. So notice here we have a reformed professor teaching Roman Catholic and Arminian ideas. Therefore, Hendrik de Kock's university training did not prepare him to be a truly reformed pastor or preacher. In fact, as a university student and then later as a young pastor, Hendrik de Kock was opposed to confessional reformed teaching, just like his professors had been. So we have an unbelieving, liberal young man who becomes a pastor in Eppenheisen, where he had his first pastorate. There in 1824, he took up his charge as a newly married man. God gave him a wife named Hellenius Venema, who at least early on in their marriage was more evangelical than he was. Later on, she would put some pressure on him as a young pastor to preach more of the gospel. So the young minister, he came from a family of influence since he was the son of a mayor. He had received a university education, which was something that was quite rare in those days in the Netherlands. Very, very small percentage of the population had a university degree. And his wife was the daughter of a rich farmer. And as a minister in the Dutch Reformed State Church, where your salary was paid out of tax money, he was in the middle of class. He had a salary pretty good for his time of $2,000 at a time when many people only made something like $700 a year. In fact, Marvin Camps, one of the biographies, biogra biographers of Hendrik de, de Kock, estimates that the buying power of this salary would be around $100,000 in the United States today. After a few years in Eppenheisen, de Kock accepted a call to Nordlaren, where he preached from 1826 to 1829 and continued to preach a very man-centered message. Marvin Camps explains what came from de Kock's pulpit. I quote, he preached the gospel of self-help, of spiritual growth through human endeavor. He preached the human responsibility doctrine of Pelagianism. He proclaimed the gospel of man that confesses Jesus to be the assistant savior. Jesus is merely our example to follow. He preached the gospel that all, man, all men can save themselves if only they exercise their wills and exert themselves to heed the moral commands of the Bible and follow the good example of our Lord. 
End quote. So he didn't teach and preach a gospel of grace. Since many church members were blinded to the truth by having so many bad ministers, some thought that Decock was orthodox. But his wife realized that something was wrong. Her husband didn't preach about sin, redemption, and gratitude like a Reformed pastor ought to have done. She also realized he didn't preach about the need for dead sinners to be regenerated, that is, born again. But unfortunately, his preaching was all too typical of the time. Camp summarized his preaching like this. He was a preacher of morality and self-help human responsibility. It reminds you of some televangelists today. God used several means to wake de Kock from his spiritual slumber. The first was his reading of five pamphlets by a man called Baron van Zylen, who in this time period was publishing works that exposed the false teaching in the Dutch Reformed Church. That was the first thing that made Pastor de Kock begin to think about his worldview. And then God also used Klaus Peters Kuypinga, who was a parishioner in the church in Aurum, to challenge Hendrik de Kock's semi-Pelagian view of salvation. Challenging his pastor, Klaus Kuypinga told him, if I had to bring even one side of my salvation, then I would be lost forever. His point was that if he had to contribute even the least bit to his salvation, he knew he couldn't do it. And so he was communicating to his pastor that salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord used this as one thing to bring de Kock to the realization that salvation was of pure and sovereign grace. And then God used another local pastor to have an impact on de Kock. There was a pastor named Wormnest who ministered in a neighboring church in Welfheisen. And he provided Hendrik de Kock with a copy of John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. The year was 1831. Now, every Reformed pastor ought to have read and studied Calvin's Institutes while he was in seminary. If he didn't have a class that covered sections from it, he should have been able to read it on the side, at least. He should have been aware of it. And yet Hendrik de Kock wasn't. Reading from Calvin's work of theology, which was one of the fountainheads of evangelical Protestant theology, well, de Kock underwent a theological reformation and transformation. And it's amazing that Marvin Camps can say about de Kock, up until this point, he had known Calvin only by name. What was the effect of reading Calvin's works? Well, we're told... His eyes were opened and his understanding of God's word was enriched and strengthened. That's what Marvin Camps writes. And then in 1832, a widow in the church at Ulram gave her pastor a copy of the Canons of Dort. And astonishingly, he had never read through this confessional document before. Now God had opened his heart, had, he had learned from the teachings of Calvin, he was so excited about his discovery of the contents of the Canons of Dort that he decided he needed to publish a copy of the Canons with a brief introduction. The very fact that there was a need to publish it is a strange thing. In Reformed churches, there should be multiple copies of all the confessions in every church. And then also realizing that children were not receiving a good catechism instruction, he published the Compendium, which was a brief catechism that introduced Reformed doctrine in a question and answer format. It had been used widely in the past, and so he republished this and wrote an introduction to it. He wanted pastors to have the tools to train their children and teach the children of the church in the great doctrines of the Christian faith. So by the time the year 1833 came around, this was only one year now before the act of reformation is going to occur, de Kock was convinced that the scriptures were the final authority for what he and his church and the reformed churches must believe. He had returned to the reformation doctrine of sola scriptura, which affirmed that the scriptures alone are the final authority for doctrine and life. Up until this point, he had been happy to join with fellow liberal professors and pastors in appealing to a vague spirit of Christianity. 
in support of any crazy doctrine. But now he realized that the teachings found in the Reformed Confessions were biblical. And the result was that preacher Hendrik de Kock's sermons changed radically. His sermons were simple yet powerful. There was a dramatic change. Yes, children and teenagers could understand them, but he now preached the whole counsel of God. He preached the gospel. He preached the good news of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone in Jesus Christ, who alone is Savior. He now submitted to the authority of the scriptures. He could preach the Bible and say, Thus saith the Lord, because he believed that the Bible was the very word of God. Now, this came as a wonderful surprise to the saints in Orem. Many of them had been Bible-believing Christians. Others were awakened for the first time through the ministry of their pastor. The elders joyfully supported their pastor in his new passion for preaching the sacred scriptures. And saints from surrounding towns and villages began to flock to Orem to hear the word of God faithfully preached with authority. Because you see, there was a famine of the word of God in many pulpits in the Netherlands. What resulted from a Reformed pastor preaching the doctrines of the gospel that are the doctrines of the Reformed faith? Well, the answer is conflict. And before long, Pastor de Kock is suspended from office and then quickly deposed from the office of the ministry of the word. What happened is that Hendrik de Kock came into conflict with reformed pastors who were false teachers. Religious bureaucrats in the classis and in the provincial synod gave four grounds for suspending and then deposing Pastor de Kock. First, they disciplined him for baptizing the children of parents who were members in a local church not in the church in Ulrum. Second, they punished him for not singing man-made hymns in church. De Kock wrote an introduction to a pamphlet that defended the singing of psalms and exposed theological problems with some of the hymns that the state church had approved in 1807. The ministerial bureaucrats in the state church understood the church rules as requiring that these man-made hymns be sung in church, even though they were perhaps heretical. It was the elders in the church in Ulrum who had decided that they would not allow unorthodox songs to be sung in the worship service. Third, de Kock was penalized for charging two liberal ministers, Reverends Brower and Redingeus, with violating the oath the two made when they signed the formula of subscription to become a Reformed preacher. Brower and Redingeus had published teachings contrary to the Reformed confessions. Fourth, the religious leaders went after de Kock because he had the temerity to use strong, although biblical, language in condemning false teachers like Brower and Readiness as false teachers, and he called them wolves. Pastor de Kock had written a pamphlet entitled this. It was in response to these two ministers attacking Reformed believers. A defense of true Reformed doctrine and of true Reformed believers who have been opposed and exposed by two pastors or the sheepfold of Christ attacked by two wolves. De Kock's opponents were false teachers who denied the divinity of Christ, rejected the cross as a wrath-appeasing sacrifice, denied the necessity of the Holy Spirit causing dead sinners to be born again, preached that Jesus had sinned, and claimed that neither heaven nor hell existed. Ron Gleason is also critical about how de Kock took to baptizing the children of members of other congregations, as he puts it. But Gleason doesn't take into consideration the reason why de Kock baptized the children of saints who were members of neighboring churches. And then the funny thing is that later on, the Dutch Reformed bureaucrats actually felt that they couldn't penalize de Kock for baptizing the children of believers who were from other towns and other churches in other towns, because there was actually nothing technically in their ecclesiastical regulations that forbid that. So for once, their ecclesiastical regulations boomerang back on them again. But what happened is that saints from towns that were near or neighbored Ulrum had apostate, rationalistic, unbelieving ministers. These ministers denied the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith. Their theology was in conflict with the scriptures and the Reformed confessions. 
Now, when parents presented their children for baptism in a Reformed church, they promised, among other things, to raise their children in the doctrines taught in this Christian church. That's how the form went. And some Bible-believing Christians interpreted this in terms of the confessional teachings of their church. Well, in good conscience, then, they could promise and vow to raise their children in the teachings of their local church when those teachings were understood as the official, official confessional teachings that were in the Reformed confessions. But other parents thought that they needed to understand the language about raising their baptized children in the doctrine taught in this Christian church as referring to the teachings that were actually being taught by the apostate preachers in their local church. These parents felt that they couldn't in good conscience make a vow to raise their children in the wicked teachings of these unbelieving ministers. So the result is that parents were not presenting their children for baptism. This also is an evil that Ron Gleason's criticism doesn't take into consideration. So a man named Arend Jan Skonnort from the town of Outhuizen contacted the elders and pastor to cock at Ulram and requested baptism for his child. Since Pastor Hendrik de Kock was preaching the truth of the gospel in the church that he pastored, the parents felt they could make the baptismal promise to raise their children in the doctrines being taught in the church in Ulrum. Now, neither the elders in Ulrum nor Hendrik de Kock took lightly this step of baptizing children of parents from neighboring churches. De Kock wrote a letter to a Reverend Molinar who he respected, and he asked his advice on this. And that person admitted, yes, there was an evil involved with many covenant children not receiving the sign of the covenant, yet he cautioned the cock against taking this step. And then finally, though, the elders in Orem decided that given the context, they would authorize their pastor to baptize the child of Arend Skonort. And then following this baptism, Pastor de Kock baptized 15 more children from neighboring congregations. Now, the neighboring pastors were angered at this, and the apostate ministers in the bureaucracy moved quickly to remove Hendrik de Kock from the ministry. By December 19 of 1833, de Kock was suspended from the ministry, although he still could get paid his salary. By May 29 of 1834, he was deposed from the ministry by the Committee of the Province. They suspended him for two years. That meant he could not perform any ministerial duties for that period of time. He couldn't preach. The bureaucrats in the provincial synod then suspended de Kock without a salary. It's interesting that the provincial synod felt they needed to drop all the charges against de Kock except for the charge of using unchristian language against fellow ministers. Unfortunately for them, they couldn't find a rule among the large number of church rules that condemned baptizing the children of parents from a neighboring church. By May 29 of 1834, the provincial synod deposed de Kock. Now he was no longer a minister of the word in the Dutch Reformed State Church. De Kock appealed to the National Synod. That synod met in The Hague, and they overturned the decision of the provincial synod to depose him, but... Instead, they suspended him so he could carry out his office. They decided he wouldn't receive a salary. And the National Senate told the provincial people that they could depose Pastor de Kock if he didn't change his ways in six months. And so there they had given a challenge to Pastor de Kock. Would he repent? Would he humble himself? Would he change his ways in six months or he was out. It is in this context that the elders in the church in Orem show their backbone. They show their spiritual backbone. They show great courage. And that's something that elders today need to have too. When they're in churches or denominations that have become apostate, they need to stand up for the gospel. They need to be willing to sacrifice in order to lead a reform movement, which is what the elders in Ulram were prepared to do. Next time, in our next talk, we will talk about the Reformation of 1834 and the great courage of the elders and the pastor in Ulram and how they sparked a growing reform movement 
that God would use for much good 